Today is called the book of Ephesians, uh, from identity to destiny. The apostle Paul is the author. He uh, was in, in, in prison, incarcerated actually in a Roman prison, uh, tied to a Roman guard, and he is writing to the church in Ephesus, which we've been mentioning. It was a very, it was a beautiful modern day Turkey, actually, a beautiful place with a lot of paganism and all kinds of violence and all kinds of, all kinds of difficulties going on. And he's writing to a church in that region. Sometimes the Apostle Paul would write, write to the church of Corinth and other places, and he'll have a, actually give shout-outs to people. And this one, he, it's a generalized uh, letter to the geographical location of Ephesus. And uh, at the, by the time of this writing, it's probably about 50 A.D. And so he's writing to a church, and last week we spoke about it, what he was doing. And it very, it's an amazing book of the Bible. And we mentioned the whole premise of this series is called From, Ident- from Identity to Destiny. From identity to destiny. And it's very important we understand this. You're going to hear me say it week in and week out because that's the premise of our whole series that your identity leads you to your destiny. And uh, the two most important thoughts that you can have at any moment is this what you think about your, what you think about God, how you view God, and what you think about yourself determines the course of your life. And so right thinking is very, very important. A lot of people put a lot of emphasis on the spiritual war. There is a spiritual war, but primarily the, the, war, the, the war field, if you will, the battlefield is literally in the mind. This is where the battle is fought. And how you think about yourself is very, very important. Remember, they call us, by the way, if you're not familiar, they call the church, by the way, church means ecclesia, those called out to gather together, okay? Uh, they call it the church. They call the church the body of Christ, and Christ is called the head of the church. Now, why is that the case? Why do they call Jesus the head and we the body? Because Jesus said this, as the Father sent me to do my mission, so I send you. So we are his hands and we're his feet on this planet. And God has given dominion, if you will, to us. And we've lost some of that authority by giving it away by ignoring God and going our own way. So a lot of things that God does on the planet, he does through me and you. Okay, I hope you get that. He doesn't have angels doing the work. You and I are doing the work. Okay, but the primary battle is in the mind. So what happens is this. If we have the mind of Christ, if my mind's telling my, my arm to move, that's great. But if I disconnect my mind from my body, it's not going to work very good, or if I change it. So the enemy, what he tries to do is get you to believe a lie. So if he gets you to believe a lie, then you'll act in a way that's not appropriate or right or helpful. Does that make sense? You following me, everybody? So the enemy's job, if you will, it, I mean, back, lack for a better illustration, it'd be like having an angel on one side and a demon on the other one. And they're whispering in your ear, trying to get you to do something. Why? Because they recognize that you and I have primary authority on this place, earth. God has given us authority. And the enemy tries to get us to think wrong thoughts, okay? If he gets you to think wrong thoughts, then you start having wrong ideas, Raw actions, and it just perpetu- pepper, uh, perpetuates, perpetuates like a snowball going down a hill. Okay, and this is what happens. That's why it's very important to get the right thoughts. That's why you need to have the right thoughts about God and the right thoughts about yourself, for as a man thinketh, he will become. That's very, very true in Scripture. You can see that. So this is where the battle takes place. Now, the enemy understands that, and that's the reason why he tries you to get you to think the wrong thoughts about God and the wrong thoughts about yourself. And if you get it wrong, your whole life gets messed up. It messes up your destiny and your purpose. God has a destiny and a purpose about you. And wouldn't it be nice, everybody, where, wouldn't it be nice where you didn't have to worry about yourself anymore? Do you ever do that? You go to a new place, you have to go to a party or a work party, awkward work party, or worse than that, uh, a, a wedding or whatever, graduation party, or whatever, and you have to go, you have to meet the people you do not know, or how about the first day on the job, or the first day in the middle school, the first day in college, or the first day in high school, and you're sitting there, and it's awkward, and what do I do, who do I talk to, you're nervous, right? Why are we nervous about that? Why are we nervous about around, around other people for because we want to see if they'll like us, right? Will I be accepted? Will I be liked? Will I be valued? Every human being has a desire to be valued and liked and loved. And so we look for uh, people to validate us, all right? And, and if we don't feel comfortable in ourselves, we start kind of, how do, what do they think about me? And we spend so much time thinking about ourselves that we don't even notice the people around us. It's a miserable place to live. 
when you're trying to get validation from other people. How much better is it to get validation from God, to know who I am in God? God, I'm made in God's image. God loves me. He has a purpose for my life. I can throw my shoulders back. I can be confident and humble at the same time. And so it's so much better to think that way. So the enemy understands the importance of identity. That's why we've been talking week in, week out, that if you can get your, if you get your identity messed up, you mess everything up. So we want to make sure we get our identity right of who we are in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you a story about a man, a man and a son who had his identity right and what God did in their lives. Because God does not have us here just to live our lives, to occupy space and time. He has us here to make a difference. We are his hands and we are his feet. And if we know our identity in Christ and we know who God is, then we can start fulfilling what God has for us. Back in 1877 to 19, uh, Frederick, uh, I'm not going to try to do the German, so I'm not even going to try. Just call him Frederick, the German dude, okay? Uh, von, okay, Honey, mom, can you, how do you say that in German? By Schinkel, okay. All, right. All you got to do in German is go, like that, and it sounds, yeah, it's like you're sneezing. Now, by the way, I can do that because I'm German. Okay. All right. Sounds like Klingon. Okay. So, <laughs> so what happened was these guy, this guy was, uh, this guy, he began something called Bethel. It was a place of Bethel and he, he opened a home and a, a ministry to reach out to disfortunate people, people with epilepsy, the forgotten ones in society. And this happened in Germany. And so I was uh, reading an article uh, about Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his, in a biography about him by Eric McTaxis. And he writes this about these guys. Okay. So Bethel, which is this ministry, began in 1867 as a Christian community for people with epilepsy. But by 1900, including several facilities that cared for 1,600 physically and mentally disabled persons, Frederick Jr. took it over at his father's death in 1910. And by the 1930s, it was a whole town with schools, churches, farms, factories, shops, and housing for patients, nurses, and caregivers. At the center were numerous hospital and care facilities, including orphanages. Bonhoeffer, who was the uh, gentleman pastor, saw that Bethel as an antithesis of the Nazi worldview that exalted power and strength. It was the gospel made visible a fairy tale landscape of grace, where the physical and the mentally disabled were cared for in a Christian atmosphere. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Sometimes I see people that are struggling. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do something to make the difference? And sometimes we feel powerless. But this guy knew who he was in Christ, right? He knew who God was, and he was called by God to make a difference. Now, what happened during this time? The Nazis were raising in power, and they came against them. Because Nazis, what they were doing, they were killing the people that were less desirable. They killed people that had ailments. In fact, I think my mother shared a story with me. Wasn't it, my, wasn't it Poppy's? Was it his brother? My grandfather, my, my, my mother's father, we call him Poppy. Okay, Not Big Poppy. That's from the Red Sox. <laughs> but Poppy. Poppy had, uh, my Poppy. My grandfather, William Harcuff, had a, uh, a, a daughter or a, a sister. Or was it a man? You don't know? Okay. Talk about it at lunch. Her brother's, brother. her brother's brother. Okay. Her brother's brother, he had some problems. He was, he was handicapped. And the Nazis took him and killed him. Never saw him again. Oh, we're going to take care of him. And they took him apart. And they killed him. And this is what was going on in the Nazi regime. They had no respect for life. And by the way, anytime a society does not respect life, look out. You can see what happens. If you kill the unborn and kill the elderly. Okay, and then you start saying, well, they're costing too much life. And that's why you don't even have Down syndrome children too much anymore because people are getting scans, and if they don't like it, we'll have an abortion. And how sad is that, that God has used all sorts of people? So when you start getting rid of the less desirables, that's exactly what happened in Nazi Germany, and it's happening in the United States of America if we're not careful. So here, the, the, the point is this. He knew who God was. He knew who he was, and he had a mission to make a change. God has you and I here for a reason to make a change. And the only way we're going to do that is we need to know who God is. And we need to know who we are in God. 
And then you're not going to be wasting your time trying to, am I good enough? I don't care about me. I want to love God and I want to love people. How much better is that, everybody? That's the way to live your life. Why do you want to live your life trying to measure up to everybody else? Why do you want to compare yourself to other people? Why do you want, I, it's, it's so exhausting, right? Why not be about God and what he's doing and make a difference in the world that your life actually matters for something beyond just breathing and existing and taking up space and paying bills, right? And taking pills. A lot better to have a purpose and a vision. And this is what God wants to do in our lives. And how he does that is by us getting a vision. So your identity leads to your destiny. And we want people to find their destiny in Christ. Now, we mentioned this last time. I'll go through it quickly. The, the, the wrong premise is this. I do, therefore I am. That's wrong. Instead, it should be this way. I am, therefore I do. So we rather go after your identity. Your identity leads to your behavior rather than focusing on behavior and not paying attention to the identity. This is why many of us get sick, and, sick to death of church. I got tired of church too because I saw a lot of hypocrisy. People say one thing and they do another. They rather have the exterior look good, but they don't care about the interior. Jesus hated that. He says, I'd rather have your heart right first. And so it's better to get people's hearts changed rather than focus on the behavior. Does behavior matter? Yes, but it has to be in the order between identity first, then behavior comes second. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah. I appreciate you. <laughs> have a cup of coffee on the house. Okay. <laughs> and a lemon square. Those lemon squares are good, by the way. Look out for those lemon squares. So uh, for those of you at home, you're missing out. But what happens is your identity leads to your destiny. You need to know who you are. And so that's why it's so important that we tell people who their identity is. And let me say something very, very important. You might may not like it. Uh, I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again, that men and uh, husbands and wives have an ability to name and tell their children their identity. Especially as they get older, the males have, women have um, power and the men have power. But guess who's the one that chooses the sex of the child? The, ma the man's seed chooses either it's a boy or a girl. And often fathers speak identity over their children. Now we have God the Father. So that's why men, we want to rise up and we want to speak identity into our children. We want to speak identity to our society. Husbands and wives, men and women, if you come from a single household, that's okay because God's our father, but God has an identity. And so we're surrogate, if you will. We're, I'm a, I may be the father of Luke and Hannah and Matthew, but ultimately the real father is God the father, and I'm an underfather, if you will. Right? And so we want to speak identity. That's why it's very important we understand our identity. You see, we talked about the two most important thoughts is of what you think about yourself and what you think about God. And we cannot find who we are without knowing who God is. If we want to change our destiny, we must change what we think about God and ourselves. Now, I know I'm repeating myself. Why? Because I want to make sure we get this. Why? It's e eternally important. It's extremely important that we understand the most important thing we can think at any moment is what we think about God and what we think about ourselves at all times. You and I have to pull the weeds of wrong thinking all the day. I don't understand why my driveway, which is concrete, grows weeds. I'm trying to grow grass, can't grow it. But the weeds come through the little cracks, right? And so we constantly have to get, don't tell anyone this, I'm doing this, but we have to get Roundup, which is bad for the environment and gives you cancer. But that's okay, as long as it gets rid of the weeds. So we'll have to pull the weeds and use Roundup. Someone in the last service says use vinegar. I'll try it. Okay. But seriously, you got to always pull the wrong thoughts out of your head. And the enemy sows crazy seeds in school systems, in families, and we have to constantly make sure God's truth and the lies, and we have to be truth police in our own minds with the truth of heaven. Does that make sense? Okay, so with that being said, last week we spoke about the Apostle Paul. We spoke about what he talked about. And the Apostle Paul, in this particular chapter, and from verses 15 to 23, he begins to pray a perfect prayer. How many of you like praying? Okay, all five of you. Okay. All right. Sometimes, ever wonder what to pray about? Like, what do I pray about? Right? I don't know what to pray about sometimes. Well, here is an, a perfect prayer you can pray over yourself, over your family. I want to pray over you. And these are beautiful prayers because they're perfect prayers. We're praying the actual will of God. So I want to encourage you that you, when you read the Bible, read it, underline it, and mark it up so it marks you. And then after you read it, go back and pray it in. All right? So a perfect prayer to release God's destiny upon your lives. 
I like it. Praying scripture is like taking words of God and breathing them back to him. It's a way of aligning our hearts and our mind with his will and purposes for our lives. That's what we want to be able to do by praying scripture. It's the perfect will of God, a great way to pray. Now, the Apostle Paul, now we go to Ephesians chapter 1 through 15. We're going to take a time to look at this prayer and see how it affects our lives, all right? So now the Apostle Paul is speaking. He says this, for this reason, what reason? For the things he just said and for this. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, for this reason. Last week we spoke about this. This is who you are. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, this is your identity. God has chosen you. You're not the last one on the team. God picked you before the foundation of the earth. He picked you. God adopted you. You have all the rights and, and all the rights that anyone else would have in Christ Jesus. God redeemed you. He bought you with a price. God made you known to us the mystery. He begins to show us who he is. Okay, God gives us inheritance. That's right, an inheritance. That means that great things are ahead for us in Christ Jesus. That's why you hear me say all the time, the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. The best days are ahead. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory because in Christ, we're more than conquerors through him. Now, are there difficult days we will face? Absolutely. Even though we may cry, and I've been to funerals where people have died, and it's a very sad time, but we mourn with hope. I've been depressed with hope. That, yeah, this is horrible, God, what's going on, but I know the best is still yet to come. So struck down, but not destroyed, as the Apostle Paul says. So he's given us an inheritance, and also he sealed us with the Holy Spirit, that we are marked by him. He cares about you. You're not forgotten. He knows all about you. Jesus even says he knows every single hair follicle on your head. He knows your hopes. He knows your dreams. He knows what you're going through. Through. He knows how you feel lonely sometimes. He knows all those attributes of your life. So today, as we continue to look for this reason, because I have heard of your faith. The apostle Paul heard of their faith. He's in prison. And he's excited about it. So what does he do? He heard of the faith, and what? Your love towards all the saints. So he heard of their faith. He was excited about that, and he heard about their love. Now, how many of you like to use the mirror? Okay, no one likes to use the mirror? Okay, okay. I like using the mirror. Uh, I don't always like what I see, but I like using the mirror. I incidentally, last week was my birthday, and I, uh, many people came up to me and said, Pastor, you look pretty good for your age. Can't you just say I look good? Why do you have to say for my age? That means there's a problem, okay? Just say you look good. You never tell a 20-year-old, you look good for your age. Okay, I got issues that require tissues. Let's move forward. Jesus and your love towards all the saints. So what is a mirror? A mirror tells you what you look like. If, you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you want to see how well you're loving each other. And by the way, the word love there is agape. You know what agape means? Self-sacrificial love. It means I'm going to give something to you without requiring something in return. When you give something and have an exchange, it's called business. When you give without expecting anything in return, I don't require anything in return. I'm going to bless you no matter what. How many of you like going to a store, right? You go to a store, you ever go to a clothing store, and they're just all over you like, like flies on whatever, uh, like bees and honey, okay? And, and they're coming to you, and they're so nice to you, and they're on commission. But if you go to the Apple store, for example, I'm not saying, but they have no commission. So they'll tell me, now nah, you don't need a MacBook Pro. A MacBook Air would serve you just fine. Really? Oh, yeah, you don't need that because they don't care. They're just there to serve. They're not trying to get something out of me. And how much better is that, everybody? That's what love is. I'm not saying Apple's love, Okay. So I'm not promoting Apple. I'm just showing you the ex example of trying to get something out of somebody. How much better is it that we choose to love people and expect nothing in return? I'm not going to require something from you. You know what that happens? When you go, I want to bless someone instead of taking something out of them. Validate me, validate me, validate me, validate me. I mean, how exhausted. Oh, no, here comes that guy. Here comes that girl. They want me to validate them all the time. How about you just, I'm going to bless you. I don't care what you give back to me. It's not much better. That's what real love is. The Bible says agape towards all the saints. 
You know what, you know what you are? You're a saint. You're a saint. If you've given your life to Christ, you're a saint. So we should call each other Saint Eric, right? Saint Luke, Saint Sandra, Saint Hannah, okay? Saint Joe, Saint Stephanie. I expect you guys to call each other saints because if you've given your life to Christ, you are a saint. No, I ain't. Yes, you are. In fact, I, I read this quote, I like it. To live above with the saints we love, that will be glory. To live below with the saints we know, that's quite another story. And that's true. You'll have a great opportunity. You want to see how good your love for God is? How do you treat people who are not like you? Ah! Okay, here we go. Remain in love. And remain in agape. Remain trying to bless somebody else. and not. You know what? You really get blessed when you give. You really do. That's why you feel so good when you do things nice for people. Ever you notice that? It feels good. Yeah, but why do we always want to grab? All right? So, a new commandment. This is what Jesus told us. A new commandment I give you, that you what? Love, agape, one another. Just as I've loved you, you also ought to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Here at the church, we should be different. Social media exchanges with each other should be uplifting. We shouldn't be copying the world. And if someone disagrees with you, let's demonize them. No, we should have different views and love each other. Now, we never compromise the essentials of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't compromise Jesus being the Savior of the world. We don't compromise the Bible being the Word of God. But other issues, let's show preference for each other. Let's show love to each other. Let the outside world go, wow, they have different social and economic classes. They have different places of a, a, a strata in society, but they all work together as a family. The world is looking for that. They're longing for a family, and we should be that way by showing love and respect to each other. Love one another as Christ has loved us. Does that make sense, everybody? We should be exhibiting that. And by the way, it always starts small. So here it goes. It first starts with me and God, then my family. Ah, yeah. Who you're married to, your mother and father, your sister and your brother. It happens here. Then you move it to the community you're around. And so if you, you want to see how are you doing with God, how are you doing in your relationships to other people? In fact, the Bible says this. If anyone says, I agape God and hates his brother, he is a liar. So you see, if we can't do it at home, we can't do it out there. If you can't do it in your home, you can't do it outside. If you can't do it here, that's why it's so wonderful that we get to practice in our households. We get to practice in church to love. How do you love your brother or not? If you don't love your brother, you don't love God. If you don't respect your brother, you don't respect God. How can you say that? That's wrong. No, it's not. What does the Bible say? It says very clearly, if, if I love God and hates his brother, he's what? He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So if you can't show respect to another believer in Christ, you're not going to show respect to God. The biggest mirror I have is my wife, Sandra. That's why every morning I comb my hair around her. Honey, how do I look? No. I look at her. How do I treat her is how I treat God. And there's something I heard many years ago. An older gentleman told me this. He said this. There's two people you can't outgive. You can't outgive God, and you can't outgive your wife. Men, I challenge you to try to outgive your wife. You can't. And so I encourage you to, that's how you look at each other. How you treat each other is how you treat God. Because if you can't treat someone well who you, who you do see, you're not going to treat God right who you do not see. That's just the way it is. Just the way it is. So for this reason, the Apostle Paul says, I have heard of your faith in the Lord and your love towards all the saints. He's saying, I'm so grateful for that. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So the Apostle Paul saying, I am so thankful that you guys are doing it. Have, and, and he prays for them. Have you ever noticed this? Hey, guys, uh, we have prayer requests. Any prayer requests? No, I'm fine. Any prayers? No, I don't need any prayers. Why is it we only pray when things are wrong? Why don't we pray and say thank you? Maybe next time you get together with somebody, you have any prayer requests? Yeah, I just want to thank God for blessing. I want to thank God that yesterday I went to a party I could overeat pizza and gelato. I could actually overeat. Okay? 
And so why is that a good thing? I'm so blessed I can overeat. I'm so blessed that my family is home. I'm so blessed I can take a shower this morning. I'm so blessed to be here this morning sharing with you the most important relationship I have is with God and that I can share with you the insights and the love God has for you and get to tell you how much God loves you, how he's passionate about you. He knows your pain. He loves you. He has a purpose for your life. I mean, what greater thing can I do than that? I get to do it. Thank God for that. I thank God that I get to help you see Jesus. Don't look at me. Look at Christ. My job is to bring you and help you to experience what God has for you. And what a privilege that is. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I I can actually walk. I can talk. I have all these blessings, right? I want to thank God for that. Thank that my parents, I have an ability to, to have my parents in church today. I can talk to them. I can see them, right? What a blessing, why? To give thanks for you, remembering you always in my prayers, praying and thanking God for somebody. Can you thank God if someone gets into a college you can't get into? Do you thank God when someone gets married and you're not married? Can you thank God if someone gets a pay raise? Can you thank God if someone's in better shape than you are? Can you thank God? We should be able to do that. We should be able to bless each other and thank God. It's such a better place to be. And church should be that kind of place where we celebrate each other. So we want to remain in love. And we want to have thanksgiving prayers. Now, what does that mean? Well, gratitude brings you to God's altitude. If you want to be in a high level, be thankful. God loves thankful people. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Enter his courts with praise. Thanksgiving and praise opens you up for the supernatural. It opens you up to the favor of God. Because whatever you focus upon, you will drive towards. The Bible has now, behavior psychologists tell us that. It's so true. Whatever you focus on, you will drive towards, whatever it is. I mentioned before, I got to stop being so negative. I got to stop being so negative. I got to stop being so negative. Guess what I'll be? Thank you, God, that I'm a positive person. Thank you, God, I'm a good driver. Thank you, Father, I'm a good driver. I will not hit the garage. Thank you, Father, I'm a good driver. (laughs) Thank you, Father, I'm a good golfer. I'm a good golfer. Hey, I'm serious. You start saying the right thing. Thank you that I have a good marriage. Thank you that I'm patient with my children. Thank you, Father God, that I have, I have self-discipline. Thank you that I, can, that I can control myself in Jesus' name. Thank you that I'm a positive person. Thank you that I bring life to people. You know what begins to happen? Your mind hears it. It gets into your subconscious. The Holy Spirit comes upon it, and you start driving towards God's success in your life, and true success is knowing the will of God and accomplishing it in power with the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ. That's true success. And that's what God has us for. And gratitude sets you up to the altitude of heaven. Be negative, find everything wrong. I mean, any, I'm sorry, I want to be positive. It's very easy to be negative, right? Try to find the good in circumstances. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, every single moment. I'm sorry, everybody, I'm getting choked by this thing. Um, We should be thanking God in every set of circumstances. Excuse me one second. There we go. Give thanks to all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What's God's will for you? Rejoice in everything. Pray and give thanks. This is God's will for you. And you know the truth of the matter is? You start doing that, you start feeling better. You start thinking better. And who doesn't want to hang out with somebody that's encouraging? Who doesn't want to hang out with someone that is seeing life and everything? Oh, you want to make fun of people and tell how bad they look on social media? Can you believe they wore that or did that? What an idiot that person is. You might get the laughs, but they're cheap laughs. And then your friends are like, what happens when I'm not around? Are they going to speak about me? But if you speak good about people when other people are around, they're like, man, I bet he says nice things about me when I'm gone. You see how that works? We have a very negative culture. This is all life-giving power that God wants to give us. We should be places of refreshment with people. When they see you coming, oh, good, I'm going to be encouraged. Now, I wish I could say I was perfect about that. You really want to test yourself. You really want to test yourself with this. Go to motor vehicle and be positive. <laughs> when you get to the front, when you get to the front counter and they say, I'm sorry, you need this piece of paper and you don't have it after you waited three and a half hours. You look the woman or the guy in the face and go, I thank you so much for doing your job so well. <laughs> and then you bite your lip until it bleeds and you go home and you blame your spouse for losing it. That's the way you're supposed to do it. Okay. Or blame your parents. Okay. So that's your will for Christ Jesus. And the Apostle Paul says this, I do not cease to give thanks 
for you. Remembering you my prayers. We should be praying for each other, praying these prayers upon each other, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. I'm praying that God gives us wisdom. What's wisdom? Knowledge rightly applied. We need wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge of him. And the knowledge of him is gnosko. Gnosko is the word in Greek. It's used for many different uh, definitions. But what it simply means is I know you. I don't just know about you. I know you. I have the opportunity to go to the Grand Canyon. I read about the Grand Canyon. I actually hiked to the Grand Canyon. I went to the top. I went to the bottom and I went back up again. And I had a chance to to experience the Grand Canyon. I don't only know about it, I've actually hiked it. I've been in the Grand Canyon. I drank two gallons of water. I got scared with the coyotes. It was was fantastic. Okay, don't go by yourself. I was by myself, okay? So I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you my prayers, that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and knowledge of him. To know, I want to know him and the fellowship of his sufferings, to know Christ. When you know Christ, you know yourself. I don't know if you realize that. The more you know God, the more you know yourself because the spirit of Christ holds you together. You are from him. You are made by him. And so the best way to know yourself is to know God. And when you know God, you can truly know yourself. It's a beautiful combination that God has for us. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know the hope. What's the hope? Hope is not what it is in the the United States. Hope is not in the English language today. What we say right now, for example, I said yesterday, I hope it doesn't rain the whole day because we have Vietnam growing in my yard. I mean, we have jungles in our yard. We had to cut the grass, and Matthew was so nice to cut the grass. And so I, I hope it doesn't rain. Now, what hope is biblically is this, a future fact not yet realized. So it's like having, a, for example, you know you get paid on Fridays? I have a hope of my paycheck's coming. I know it's coming. I'm just, it's just a future fact not yet realized. That's what hope is. And so hope is extremely important. And we have the hope of our salvation. That gives us the strength to move on. That's why no matter what we're going through, we can encourage each other with the hope of that, to which he's called you, which we are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So remain in love, thanksgiving and prayer. We have the hope of our calling. The best days, as I mentioned before, are ahead. I know where I'm going in Christ. You see, what oxygen is to the lungs, such is hope to the meaning of life. No matter how bad things get, we have hope. Just this morning, I've been thinking of a, of a, a woman who unfortunately lost her husband to cancer. They don't come to this church, but they've been in my mind. And so finally, this morning, I just feel like I got to text this her and I let her know I'm praying for her and that God understands what she's going through. So I got the number, and this morning I was just looking through the notes. I, I texted her and said, I just want to let you know God loves you. Whatever you're going through, he, he understands what you're going through, and I'm praying for you. Just thank you. I needed that right now. Because I'm, I'm not thinking of myself. I'm thinking of God. What's it? God said, I really care about this woman right now who's in Florida. Would you text her? And, and then I make her day. I mean, I help her day. Isn't that a better way to live, right? And so we want to be about oxygen like that. We want to be able to make a difference. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know the hope which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance. We have an inheritance, everybody. And now notice this. I didn't catch this when I read it fast. Look at this. What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of, what does it say? Didn't say mine. Oh, wait a minute here. What? That must be a typo. It's not a typo. And chat GPT didn't do it, okay? He called you. What are the riches of what? His inherit, glorious inheritance. Guess who his inheritance is? You and me. What? Yeah. Jesus is excited about his inheritance. You're in the bank of heaven. He loves you. He loves me. He has an inheritance in us. Do you realize that? God's calling you for something. So God loves you. He wants you. He actually wants you. He loves you. You're his inheritance. Just like my children are my inheritance. So this is how that works. Remain in love, thanksgiving and prayers, hope of calling, rich inheritance, and that's of Christ. We are Christ's inheritance, everybody. 
You're wanted. How about that? You're loved. You're wanted. You mean something to God. He cares about you. His plans are so much better than our plans. They really are. Isn't that a beautiful thing to realize? He wants you as his inheritance. See, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us? His power. The word power there means dunamis. Dunamis is the Greek word. We get the word dynamite. Power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We have great authority because our dad are, is in heaven and he's given us great authority. So we have an inheritance and we have rights. And his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, and dunamis, and power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's to my advantage that I go, that I may send the helper, the same spirit that animated me and gave me the power to do miracles, which is part of the Godhead, I'm going to send to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, to your advantage. So what does that mean? Well, we're, we're fighting a spiritual battle, everybody. We need spiritual weapons for warfare. And here it is. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, okay? But against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. So we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Now check this out. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Praying that over us, praying about our glorious inheritance, knowing who we are in Christ. My question to you is this. Do you have an inheritance? Are you Jesus' inheritance? Have you surrendered yourself to him? Or are you doing what they did in Massachusetts last week at the Satan, Satan festival they had? Do you know what the first sentence in the Satanic Bible is? I hope you don't know, but I'll tell you what it is. Do what thou wilt. In other words, have it your own way. Sounds a little like Burger King, doesn't it? Do what you will. Be your own God. That's Satanic. And the moment you do that, you ruin yourself you ruin your family. You ruin society. You cannot be a God. You're a horrible God. You ruin everything. That's why absolute power corrupts absolutely because you're not supposed to be all-powerful. God is all-powerful. You make a horrible God, and so do I. Have you surrendered your throne to God? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe some of you have never done that. You know, it's not about coming to church. It's not about just believing in Jesus. But have you surrendered your life to Christ? There's two things that Christ asks you to do. Number one, believes that he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And you have to be willing to step down from being in charge of your life. How many would say here today, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time. I've never done it. But today I choose to put Christ first in my life. I choose to give my life for Christ today. Or I used to walk with Christ. and I'm not walking anymore and I want to get right. I see a quick show of hands as the worship team plays a little bit. Anyone say that right now? Any show of hands? Say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time. I renew my commitment. Anyone this morning? Okay. So, Father, we thank you for today. I ask you bless. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name. If you want to repeat after me in your own heart to give your life to Christ, and just repeat in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And today, I choose to step down from being in charge of my life. I give my life to you in Jesus' name. Amen.